definitely recommend you guys play with that a little bit. <laughs> but the point is, you know, don't overthink this shit, right? And you can use ChatGPT to create this stuff for you if you want to get creative and then you can start putting your things together. But that's how you utilize ChatGPT to create those SMS messages. Um, but nevertheless, so when we send out a, a blast and we're marking it out to these sellers, we keep that message simple. They respond. And then from there, our VA send them over to our podio, right? Once they send them over to our podio, um, and basically the responses are anything that says, yes, I'm interested. What's your offer? Um, what else? Uh, anything that's on the lines of possibly selling the property. If the number isn't super duper high, if it makes sense, like I said, using that Zillow as a baseline, then those are the properties that we put over in our, in our CRM and our podio. And we will consider them an actual lead, quote unquote, a lead that we want to target. Now, whether they're hot or warm, that's that's up to discussion, right? That's up to debate based on what you would consider hot to you. Um, and, you know, pretty much what's hot to us uh, is really uh, if they're ready to sell ASAP. We'll get into this a little bit later, too. But if they're ready to sell ASAP, uh, they have a legitimate reason to sell the property and the price makes sense or in range. And that's a hot lead, right? Um, if a warm lead would be that they're probably the only thing would be different is the time frame. So they may be ready to sell in about three to six months. You know what I'm saying? Um, but they do have a legitimate reason to sell the property and the prices in range. So we don't do cold leads. We just do hot or warm. Um, if if none of that stuff falls in line, we just put them in like a do not call and then we'll recycle those out again and let our VAs go through those leads again in about six months. That's pretty much our plan from the SMS. But like when they come in and when they come in in the SMS and we find, we see the opportunities that we want to attack or go after or target, that's when we pick up the phone and we talk to them, right? Um, but let me go into the cold calling side on the marketing. So if you guys are cold calling, right, um, and you're qualifying, you want to you wanna make sure that you minimize the people that are going to waste your time, Right. And the way that we do this is we minimize our qualifying questions. So we shorten our qualifying questions when we, because we used to do, go through a whole entire script for cold calling, long script, right? But we minimize our qualifying questions to like three or four simple questions, right? So one of the questions is we want to confirm if they're the owner of the property. So what that sounds like is you have your introduction and you say, hey, John, this is Ty with, prop, with Property Jet. Or you can say, hey, John, this is Ty. Um, I was giving you a call. I see you have some interest in, in your property and selling your property or considering offering your property. Uh, are you the owner of that property? Or you can say something even shorter. Hey, John, I was calling about the property on 123 Main Street. Are you the owner of that property? I like that a little bit better. That's what I normally say. Um, so, hey, John, I was looking at property on 123 Main Street. Are you the owner of that property? He says, yes. Boom. We already confirmed that he's the owner of that property. Next thing is you want to see if they're open to an offer, right? And it's the way you, you say it, right? All about how you say things and how you word things. So um, you don't want to say, I want to, you know, I was calling to see if you wanted to sell your property. No, I don't want to sell it. You call me. It's I want to see if you would consider an offer, if you are open to an offer, if you are open to selling, right? If you're open to selling. Um, interested in selling, interested in the offer, things like that. That's the word, the terminology I like to use, open and open to selling, open to an offer, interested in selling, interested in the offer. Um, and that will eliminate those people that said, oh, you called me. I don't want to sell. I don't have to sell it. You know, that'll eliminate a lot of that. So it's about how you word it. So are they the owner? Are they open to an offer, interested in the offer, interested in selling, right? And then lastly, the, le the next one is, um, how soon do they want to sell the property, right? Because that's important because if you're talking to somebody that want to sell the property for another six to eight months, then that's a waste of time. We don't want to send those people in, right? So um, how soon would they, do they want to sell the property? Those are the, like the top key qualifiers that we utilize. And then lastly, we ask a price too, right? As a bonus, if they want to give us a price, then, you know, We'll get the price from them. If not, then those other three questions are kind of the main ones that we go after. So if they say, um, 
the final thing would be like, you know, what would be an offer that you would consider? What would be a price that you feel, you know, is fair for the given the condition of the property? And mind you, this is our VAs doing this on the cold calling side. This is not us doing this on the acquisition side. So this is a pretty much our script that our VAs have. It's like three or four questions. And then from there, our VAs will be like, okay, well, one of our acquisition managers will give you a call and give you that offer. Now, there's pros and cons to all of that. But like I said, the main thing is you don't want to waste your time with people who aren't interested in that stuff. So even if you're doing this yourself, you can qualify them like that that quick. And that only takes literally about 45 seconds. And that way you're able to go through as many people as possible by mi minimizing the amount of questions that you ask. Now, if they if those questions check off, then we can go to the next the next thing, which is talking about the property condition, because that takes the most time. Uh, got a question here. Have you run into sellers who say they want to sell a cat sell to a cash buyer, but say the house has been updated, renovated? Do you work with them or do you just move on since it's not distressed? Um, typically I move on since it's, you know, since it's not, since it's updated or renovated, but nowadays I make offers, you know what I'm saying? Because you never know what these sellers are willing to take. First, I want to see where they're at as far as price goes. And if my offer is going to be, you know, more than 50 K than what their price is at, then I'm not going to waste my time. But if we're around 50 K off, I'm going to make that offer anyways, because we never know. You know what I'm saying? But typically, you know, ideally, I don't try to make offers on those because they're best suited to go on market and sell to, a, you know, sell on market because cash buyers buy on market, too. Those are the buyers that usually pay a little bit more. But if it's already updated and renovated, unless they want to sell it at a discount where I can make money, then it's probably not going to make sense, you know, nine times out of 10 unless they really want to sell it. But if it's not in distress or if their seller is not in distress, then it doesn't make sense. You might as well just let them put it on market and find a cash buyer. But at the end of the day, you can still make your offer. You know what I'm saying? As long, like, like I said, what we do, if it's around 50 K from what they're asking, then we'll make that offer. If it's more than 50, 60, 70, we're not going to make an offer. It's a waste of time. Uh, anybody got any questions about anything, anything to add? We got some veterans on here. How are you guys qualifying your, your seller leads? Uh, uh, basically, what am, how am I qual qualifying my sellers? I basically, you know, are they interested in selling their property? Aside from price, do they have a reason, you know, to sell basically a valid motivation? And then also, when are they looking to sell? You mm -hmm. know, are they looking to sell within a year from now? I mean, preferably within a year from now mm -hmm. and all that. That way that determines how serious they are, whether they're, you know, seriously interested in selling or if I should just put them on a follow-up and all that, you know, mm -hmm. do they need to sell or do they want to sell? Right. So what if they just want to sell? Then basically, I mean, I would try to, you know, ask them, I mean, aside from price type, like what has you interested in selling the property? Well, I mean, you know, I get a lot of calls every day. So, you know, if I get the right number or the right price and I'll sell it. Yeah. So see, He's like, eh, well, I mean, I would ask him, you know, I would go into the price. All right, well, I mean, what are you looking to get for price? But I know that, you know, there's no true motivation and all that. And I would, I would also ask him, like, when is he looking to sell? Have mm -hmm. you thought about listing it with the realtor? Also, is he open to payments and mm -hmm. all that? Now just anchor him, you know, just anchor them, see what, how they respond. Yeah. And the reason I bring that up, because, yes, yeah. ideally – you want to go after those people and you want to really, really focus your energy on people who they, they need to sell. Obviously that's like a no brainer. Mm -hmm. You have to do that. And that's what you need to be looking for every single time. But there are sellers out there that they, they just want to sell it. You know what I'm saying? They may not even tell you the main reason why they want to sell it because they're that type of seller. You know what I'm saying? There's sellers right. that we don't know. We didn't know that they, why they wanted to sell the property, but they sold it to us because we made an offer. Um, but like you said, I think the best way to do it there is if you can get a, if you can pull for those people who, um, want to sell, right. And they're not going to give you any motivation or any distress or anything like that. Um, I think the best thing to do is try to pull a price out of them if you can. 
um, you know, you could say something like, hey, if you were to sell a property, you know, what would be a, a, a price that you'd be looking to get for it? And then from there, you can determine whether or not you want to make that offer. You know what I'm saying? Right. What if they, they hit you with this estimate? What if they want this estimate? Well, I would go back. I would run my numbers and see how accurate that estimate is. Um, I would see if, you know, if their, if their property is in the same condition as the ARV, right? If it's in the same condition as the ARV, then obviously we probably won't be a fit there. Um, then right. another thing too is like paying attention to if they primarily occupy that property. That's important because typically people who primarily occupy their property, they're going to want a little bit of higher price if they're not in that d desperate need to sell the property. So that's what I come across a lot is when people, when I ask people how much they're asking for a property and the price is high, I'm going I'm to say, you must live in the property, don't you? And nine times out of 10, they're like, yeah, you know what I mean? So um, if in that case, like if they ask in estimate, because sometimes you can move it to a hedge fund, like there's some funds that still buy, you know what I mean? You just got to find the right ones and get them at the right price. So if there's if the if the buy if the property qualifies for a fund to purchase it, if it's not super duper beat up, right? Um, and he's not in the estimate because, like I said, you got to double check that estimate because maybe the estimate says three hundred, but it's really worth three twenty, right? Like one of the flips that we're getting right now that we're about to close on next week, the estimate says two seventy seven, but we know we can sell it for three ten. You know what I'm saying? So it just really have to do your, your due diligence on understanding if that estimate is accurate, because um, it could be more or less. Because if he, like like I said, our estimate on that is 310, but if he was asking 277, then I know, okay, shit, if he's asking his estimate, then my antennas are going up after I done checked and see, okay, 310 is the real ARV. Now let me see if I can negotiate him down a little bit. Let me offer him like 250 and see if he bite. And if he bites at 250, We'll send them a contract, go on the contract. We'll go look at the property. We'll run the numbers. If we got a price cut, then we'll damn price cut. Right now, we're being aggressive. You know what I'm saying? I don't care about, you know, not terminating contracts anymore. Fuck all that. I don't care about that KPI of terminating contracts. We're trying to get deals done. You know what I'm saying? So the, the mentality is for us is be aggressive. If the numbers are close and we're like, eh, it kind of makes sense then we're going to go ahead and send it out, lock it up, and do what we got to do. If we got to renegotiate, we're not going to drag the seller along for, for, for four months, for four weeks, you know what I'm saying, to, to renegotiate the property. We're going to go look at it. Okay, we'll renegotiate in two days. So we don't have them tied up for a month or six weeks or whatever the case may be, because that's when sellers get pissed off when you tie them up for, for 30, 40, day, 40 days. But if you go to them and be up front, say, hey, well, this property is going to need a little bit more work than we anticipated. Um, we still want to buy it, but we have to be at this price and give them an option. Give them a choice. Do you want to proceed forward? That's cool. If not, then we could terminate. We both shake our hands. You don't have to worry about paying attorney fees. You don't have to. And, and we, we're good. You know what I'm saying? I think, um, you know, starting out, you're kind of a little bit you're a little hesitant on being aggressive. Um, I'm just saying you as in general, like everybody in general, but as you start getting a little bit more seasoned, then you get a little bit more aggressive and that's when you're going to start seeing more deals. You may miss a, a miss some opportunities too, but at the same time, you know, you got to be aggressive to get these deals. I went on a fucking tangent, but nevertheless, uh, let's proceed forward. <laughs> Anybody got any questions about anything or anything to add? Mm, let me add to that. Go ahead. can't hear you i will say this because me and some other people have been talking about this because we've seen a lot lately when you first start it's good the way you will ask someone to help you comp and more if you want to dig into and look at the information that ty has on the the google drive as well as the, the examples that he has as well as any other research you do on doing comps because what you don't want to do is even with being aggressive be as accurate as you can on your comps mm -hmm. because what you don't want to do is, and I'm going to give you an example because it just happened to me and I feel bad for these people, but I did not want to, even though I don't know her, I didn't want to do another wholesaler that I know 
a fact is a new wholesaler just from the mistake she made on her contract. Um, she literally over offered on this property by thousand dollars. And when that's a thousand, uh, there's no way on earth that um, the number is anywhere near accurate. You said you was breaking and up. You said she over offered how much? Fifty thousand. Yeah, that's too much. <laughs> and when I say fifty thousand, oh, I mean clear out fifty thousand and made several uh, to the point where the seller uh, brought me the contract and, <laughs> and asked me to look at it for him. And um, and it pisses me off because I already know it wouldn't take me anything but maybe maybe four. Uh, to get a, 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 I could easily cut their losses and and, and cut her out of the, the, the whole deal easily. But on the same end, I don't know what her name is because I didn't even want to look at it. <laughs> but you have to be you have to be pretty accurate in your numbers. Um, I just know that every few days. I contact the buyer again because the contract will fall through. Yeah. So I stay in contact with them. And matter of fact, he, this happened last week. He called me yesterday. Just let me know that if, if, if anything falls through with this contract, he's going to give me a call. Well, I'm still going to hit them like every three days because I know it's going to fall through. It's not optional. She's not going to get a buyer for it. So just try to be as accurate as possible. Um, get a peer to... Double check your 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 um comps, not just comping on prop stream. Use your um Redfin. Use Zillow estimates, like you said, can be up or down. They're not they're not as accurate as I wish they were. So just please be careful. Yeah, Listen. that's true. <laughs> that's true. That's true. And like you don't want to be that person where you know. So one of us, you know, somebody else swoops up your deal because you couldn't perform. You know, when I say be aggressive is 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 definitely by being smart. Right. You don't want to when you're looking at comps, you don't want to just take the highest one you see. You know what I'm uh -huh. saying? Whenever you run your comps, I, I'm always conservative. Like uh -huh. I take the lowest one and I might even I might even shave a little off of it and be like, that's my ARV. And I'll do my numbers off of that because I'm, I'm playing it conservative. And then also like looking in the comps, too. You got to look at days on market. You got to look mm -hmm. at there's so many different things you have to pay attention to. The type of buyer that bought it was a F, was it an FHA buyer? Or was it a conventional buyer? Um, you got to look at so many different things when it comes to comps. But that's a whole nother conversation. But like you said, definitely when you're being aggressive, you want to make sure your numbers do make some sort of sense and you're just being close, right? Because you don't want to be able, you can't price cut a seller fifty thousand dollars usually, you know, after an, an inspection. It's pretty tough to do. You know, some may take it. But at the same time, you got to be realistic and make sure that the numbers somewhat make sense. Like if you price cutting about 10K, okay, let's do that. You know what I'm saying? That's yeah, worth yeah, the shot. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, so cool. So that's like the qualifying side, right? Like when you qualify your sellers, there's only a few questions that you need to ask to see if it's really worth your time and pursuing and actually calling them a lead. You know what I'm saying? When you're on the cold calling side of it, right? It's really uh, the timeline is really if, confirming that they're the owner of the property um a price and those those are really the three for me right is if they're the owner what's the timeline and what's the price you know what i'm saying what's their asking price and if all of those three kind of check out if they give us that then we'll submit that as a lead and then we'll get into the next stage which is the acquisition side right so like i said we have our vas they do the marketing whether it's cold calling sms and then me and our acquisition team um, we'll get to motivation in a second. And then it's us, you know, motivation could be an important thing, but sometimes some people just want to sell the property. You know what I'm saying? I do ask it, but I don't ask it on the front end. I ask it towards, you know, towards the end a little bit. Um, I'm a little bit less structured, to be completely honest. I'm structured to a T. I bounce around a little bit. Um, Mike, my partner, he's structured as hell. He'll say the same thing from 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 beginning all the way to end i might hop around and bounce around and depending on how the conversation goes but at the same time when i do that i've been talking to over shit thousands and thousands of people 
So I know when to bounce back and get the information that I need. But if you're you're starting out and getting better and trying to work on it, definitely stay stay structured because it's going to help you have that same process every single time. So you got your intro, you got your qualifying questions, you got your condition questions, you got your motivation, you got your timeline, you got your price, and then you got all of that, right? Structure your calls. That way, when you start, you, you don't miss anything. You don't miss any important information. Um, there's a script in the drive. That structure that we use for our VAs that we use in office sometimes. I have a I have a script right here in front of me. I don't bullshit. Sometimes I have to look down at it. You know what I'm saying? So it's okay to have a script in front of you. You know what I realize? Some people don't like using a the script. They feel like I don't know why they try to freestyle shit. You don't have to freestyle. Use this script. It'll help you out. Um, so on the acquisition side, we all know follow up is key, right? So let's say a lead comes in, we making that call. Um, typically our VAs, they put in some information already. Those few questions that we talked about, they put in a little bit of information about, about that. And then we'll just qualify, right? We'll call them, say, Hey, um, Hey John, this is Ty. I'm with property jet. I'll just give you a call. I see you spoke with one of our agents, um, about possibly selling your property. Are you still interested in the offer on that property? That's the opening line right there. If they say, yeah, yeah, I am blah, blah, blah. Sometimes they'll say no because they was bullshitting our VA, and that's okay. That person will just dead that lead, or we'll ask them, hey, you know, you have any other properties? They'll say no. Okay, we'll dead that lead, and then we'll put them in a different bucket, and we'll get to that bucket at a different time. We're only looking for people who are saying yes, who are interested in selling the property. So once they say, yeah, I'm interested in selling, then we'll go, okay, sounds good. I just wanted to, you know, double check um, and get some information from, you know, all our offers are really pretty much based on the condition of the property. I wanted to ask some questions about the property um, to get that information. Do you have about five minutes, right? If somebody is willing to give you that time, chances are this is someone that is worth your time, right? Versus somebody who's like, ah, you know what I'm saying? Now, if somebody says, well, what's your offer? What's your offer? I'll still say the same thing, right? I'll say, well, our offers really depend on the condition of the property. Um, but if you want me to give you an offer, I can get you an offer, right? And then from there, I'll look at the Zillow, and then I'll probably, if the Zillow's two hundred thousand, I'll probably offer him one hundred and twenty-five thousand, and see what he says. Like those are for people that don't want to give you the time. Those are people that don't want to go through the process so you can understand the condition, right? Those are the people that I just shoot out a number and see if they bite. If they bite, then they might be serious, and then we we'll kind of go forward. But chances are, typically, those people aren't serious, right? Uh, and they want to just fuck with you. But the people that are going to go through that process, they're going to be more serious about selling that property. So we'll go through all the condition questions, right? So we ask them if they have that five minutes of, of their time so we can ask them about the condition of the property. And this part of, this, of the script and this part of the process is very important because this is where your rapport is going to be built, right? This is where you're going to be asking questions about certain things. Um, you're going to be asking about, you know, the age of the roof going to be asking about the HVAC. You're going to be asking about the water heater. Um, you're going to ask about the plumbing. I don't ask about foundation. I don't ask about electrical because if they're currently living in a property, unless it's like one of those properties that are, that, you know, is, is, a, is a, a, a full gut that's burnt down, shit like that. If it's burned, then you ask them those type of questions. But if it's a property that looks decent, um, in good shape, livable, I don't really get too much into that. I'll check that out when we go check out the property in person. And you could use that as leverage for negotiations, obviously. So ask about the roof, um, all the cosmetic stuff. You know, I get very detailed in the cosmetic stuff. So I ask about, you know, let's talk about the kitchen. Um, as far as the countertops go, do you have, you know, granite countertops, stone countertops, or do you have the laminate or mica countertops? So I'm getting an idea or a visual of what that property looks like, right? Um, what about the cabinets? Are the cabinets the original cabinets? Did you get some new cabinets in there? Uh, well, you know, I'm getting an idea of what that property looks like. The stainless steel, do you have appliances in the house? Stainless steel, or are they black? Or are they white? Updated appliances? No? Okay. I, now I know if this property doesn't have stainless steel appliances, if I'm looking to flip it or somebody that I'm selling it to is going to look to flip it, they're going to have to get the stainless steel appliances. So I'm going to have to account for that. If they're looking to flip it, and it doesn't have granite countertops or quartz countertops, well, I'm going to have to account for that. If the cabinetry is old and outdated, not updated, 
I may have to count for that, right? I'll know in person when I go see it because a flipper may replace all the cabinets or they may just paint over them depending on how what shape that they're in. So the point I'm trying to make is you're getting real detailed on these questions, right? Because you're, you're, you're going to start to build a little bit of rapport here as you go along, right? They may say something funny or you may say something or whatever the case may be. But this is where you just ask questions. You try to be as natural as possible. Um, you don't try to sound like you're interviewing these people for the most part. You make sure you have good transitions, right? So if I'm talking about the kitchen, then I might say something. Okay, sounds good. I'm taking my notes. Well, let's let, uh, walk me through the bathroom. Have you done any updates to the bathroom in, in the recent years? They say, yeah, no. Okay, well, did, do you have, you know, uh, are your vanities in original condition? Because if the vanity is in original condition, then a flipper is going to be more than likely change the vanity out. What about the shower? Is it a towel shower from, from the floor to the ceiling? Or do you have just one of those regular, you know, uh, fiberglass tile surrounds or whatever the case may be, right? Again, very detailed. Oh, uh, what about the the um? Now let's talk about the the flooring throughout the house, right? You trans you you you're making a smooth transition from your questions, so you're not sounding like you're reading off of a checklist, right? So you throw in your filler words. That's what they call them, filler words. Okay, so let's talk about the the flooring throughout the house. Is it hardwood going throughout? You got carpet. So this is where you know you you're having this conversation, right? This is all basic stuff, but it's very important because you need this information. So you can identify what repairs are needed to this property so you can make your offer. Because that's really what you need to get from this seller, right? One, you want to figure out if the seller is serious about selling this property. Then two, you want to figure out what condition the property is in. That's all you really need in order to make an offer, right? So from there, once we gather this information, then that's when I get into, well, okay, well, how long have you owned the property? I'm starting to build rapport here. Right. Based off of the condition of the house, you know, whether it's in decent shape or if it needs work or whatever, I'll go into how long have you owned it? And they'll tell oh, I owned it for about, you know, 17 years. Da, 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 whoop -de -whoop. OK, sounds good. You don't plan on renting this property out anymore. Right. So I'm eliminating other options. No, I don't want to do that. I'm not into that kind of business. I, I, I don't do that. OK, what about putting it on the market? You ever consider, you know, putting it on the market with a, a real estate agent or something like that? Is that something you would do? Uh, I don't want to deal with that. No, no, I just want to get rid of it. And, you know, da, 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 da. So you're eliminating all these other options. So I know, one, he's not going to rent out the property. I know, two, that he's not going to put it on the market. So what does that leave? That leave is going to be sold to a cash, cash buyer, a wholesaler, whatever. So we're the perfect fit, right? So I know that we're a perfect fit. So now I get into, OK. Well, um, if you don't mind me asking, what has you thinking about selling the property? That's when I get into more so of that motivation, right? Because it's like, okay, you just told me you don't want to put it on the market. You don't want to sell it you, and you don't want to rent it out. So why do you want to sell this property? Now, there's, you know, sometimes you can put it in the front of the conversation. Sometimes you can put it in the back of the conversation. I personally like to put it towards the back end of the conversation um, because I feel like once we get to this point, there's some a little a level of comfort there. Some people like to put it in the front of the conversation because you you'll you'll save time essentially, right? If you're one of those people that like to qualify based off of the level of motivation. But I look at it as if somebody's willing to have a conversation with us and then we get to this point, then they there there's some some level of seriousness there. You know what I'm saying? Now granted, there's people out there that's full of shit that don't have anybody to talk to and they're just going to talk to you all day long. Right. And those are the people you have to really start understanding and picking that up, too. on. But nevertheless, I get into the motivation on the distress level there. Right. That's when I ask that question and try to determine, you know, why they're looking to sell the property, what has them thinking about selling the property and kind of determine that. Now, if they say. Look, now we're looking for we're listening for legitimate reasons. Right. And I'm talking about they're moving out of town or the tenant is tearing up the property or the tenant is paying, you know, is not paying rent or whatever the case may be. All right. And I'm let me back up a little bit in that condition area. That's when you ask about the occupancy of the property too, um, whether it's occupied with them or occupied with a tenant, I usually lead with that. So just to confirm that, and then I missed out beds and baths too. I lead with those two things. So I didn't want to go into all the whole thing in depth, but I lead with the occupancy is the property vacant or not, then I lead into how many beds and baths is showing here on Zillow, it's three, two, is it? No, it's a four, two, that's important. You gotta confirm that stuff. Um, 
and then I get into the other stuff in detail. But nevertheless, once we get into that, I, I find out, you know, they're serious about selling. Um, they move into another place. They don't want to rent anymore. Um, something that's legitimate, not just because people have been calling, not just because they want an offer. Um, I try to find something that's legitimate. You know, by, once we get to this point, that level of comfort should be there, and they'll tell you why they don't want to, why they want to sell the property. Um, and then from there, uh, I like getting older too. Getting older is a good one. I'm not going to hold you. Somebody's 87 years old, and they say, oh, "Well, I'm 87. I don't want to deal with this." That's a good one for me. You know what I'm saying? Because they're already looking at it like, "What I'm going to do with a house? You know, I can, I can go any, any day now. Let me just get the money, and I'm, you know, I'm good." You know what I'm saying? So if they're older, that's a legitimate reason for me. Um, so legitimate reason, that's what I'm listening for. And then from there, um, I go into, okay, well, before we, you know, get into this offer here, is there anybody else that you need to speak with before you make the final decision, like a husband or a wife or a sibling or something like that? When I'm asking that question, I want to make sure there's no other person involved in making that decision. Because if I make your make the offer and then so, and the wife is not on board, then I just wasted my time making the offer, right? So we want to make sure that there's, if there, check and see if there's any other decision makers involved with the sale of this property. Even though that they might be the only person on the title or the only person that you see on prop stream, that doesn't necessarily mean that the wife or the girlfriend or the child isn't involved in that decision making process. Uh, so you don't get to burn bridges yeah exactly um so that's why that's important that's a very important question i make sure i ask that anytime before i'm making an offer just so i know what i'm dealing with i want to know I'm, I'm, I'm not stepping on anybody's toes i want to make sure that everybody's on board i want to make sure once i make this offer if the number makes sense we're good to go like i asked uh, have you guys already spoken about it okay have you guys did this so you'll have some people they'll say no, I'm the only one. I, I'm the I'm the decision maker. Da, da, da. Oh, well, my wife, you know, you know, my husband. Um, and I'll say, okay, have you guys already talked about this? Is this something that you guys discussed? You guys on both on board? Yeah, we did. Da, 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 da. Okay, perfect. Right. So now I move on to the next thing, right? Um, I ask them, you know, the timeline again. I'll say, now, if we were to agree to a price that makes sense for you guys and that will work, how soon are you looking to get the process started? Right now, I'm back again into the timeline on the back end. Right, I want to double check, and then sometimes I'll tell them typically we can close within 14 to 21 days. Sometimes that works for people, sometimes that doesn't. What, what's a good time frame for you? Right, and then they'll let you know, oh, we can close in 30 days. So now I know, boom, I'm writing it down. It's a 30 day closing, possibly. They can get out in 30 days. Right, um, now if they say 30 days. And then they say, and they, and I know that they're they occupy the property, then I would I would confirm this is where I'm doing my really my digging right here. If it's they say 30 days and I know that they occupy the property, I'll ask them, do you guys have another place to move to if we were to agree to a price and and, and close in 30 days? So I want to make sure if I make an offer, there's nothing in front of us that's gonna stop us from getting this thing accepted or signed. Right? Um, if there's a tenant in place. I'll ask them, okay, if, you know, we can close in 30 days, it, have you already have a conversation with a tenant about possibly move, about possibly selling the property? Are they aware? Uh, have you let them know? Will they be able to vacate the property in this time period? So I'm making sure I'm trying to clear all of the bullshit before we get there. If it's vacant, you ain't got to worry about that. But typically, if it's owner-occupied and tenant-occupied, then we need to make sure we address those things. So when we make our offer, we're not hitting any road bumps, right? And then from there, the last thing I do, I ask that price. So I'll say, hey, hey, Jermaine, based off of, you know, everything you told me, um, the condition of the property, et cetera, you know, what, what do you feel is a, a fair price for the property? And just shut, shut up. They may, they may sit there and it may sound crazy, but you got to be quiet. You got to be quiet. It's going to be a little three to five second awkward silence. You don't need to speak right here. You already said your, your question. They heard you. They're just thinking. Let them think and let them spit out a number. Sometimes they'll be like, uh, uh, da, da, you know, or, um, 
you know, 150. Okay, sounds good. Now, if we cover all the realtor commissions, you know, if we cover all your closing costs, you don't have to pay realtor commissions because we're buying it in cash and we'll buy it in as is condition. What is what's the what's the best you can do? What's your bottom line? Or do you have any wiggle room on that? Flexibility. Words like that I like I like to use. And you may have somebody that say, I have a little. Okay. Sounds good. So that lets me know that 150, I can probably get them down. If they stone cold say no, okay, I got it. I know where I'm at with you. Right? Now, if they don't give me a number or a, a, a price, then I'll say, okay, sounds good. Because some people, they're going to be like, well, no, no, I'm not going to play this game. You give me your offer, and then we'll go from there. Okay, Jermaine, I got you. I completely understand. I got all the information I need right with me right here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this information to my manager or my underwriter, which is me, right? Well, they don't know that. And then I'm going to get back to you with an offer. It may take about 20, 30 minutes, depending on what time of day you call them, right? If you call them throughout the middle of the day, you get back to them that same day. Um, or if it's at the end of the day, let's say today, you know, I'll say something like, well, it's getting a little, it's a little later now. And he stepped out of the office, but um, I'll be able to give you a call tomorrow. What's the best time that works best for you tomorrow to give you a call with that offer? So you, which, with the price, you want to try to pull that price out right um there's another technique that i use something that i say to get the price too um uh, i would say something like okay well you know i just wanted to get something in my hand to give to my underwriter because if they don't if they don't have anything to work with then they're going to set the price and typically when they set the price it's a little bit lower so i just want to make sure that we're somewhat in the ballpark in the range so we're not wasting each other's time here so what would you say is a number that you would consider and just be quiet Right. So if I really trying to get that price out, you know, what I'm saying, because you never know, like that price that, that they initially told our virtual assistants on the front end, that price will change by the time we had this conversation. Sometimes it stays the same. Sometimes they don't even know you work with the same people. They may think they talk to somebody else completely. They don't know. They get calls every day from different people. So they don't know. So they told our virtual assistant 170. They just told me 150. Because we had a legitimate conversation, built some rapport. They gave us time. We sound legitimate. Like we actually good, asking good questions. We, you know, we done spent 10 minutes, 15 minutes on the phone now. You know what I'm saying? So that price done dropped. So I'm asking them that price again. Right. And then even when I ask them that price, I want to see if that's the best they can do by saying, okay, we cover your realtor commissions, you know, codes and costs, all these different things. You know, what, what, what's the best you can do or what will be your bottom line? Or do you have any flexibility or wiggle room? Then once we get that price out of them, whether we, if we get the number, cool, we'll say, okay, sounds good. I'm going to just go ahead and get this over to my underwriter. Um, but in the meantime, let me get your email so I can send you some information about our company. What's a good email for you? We'll get their email, boom, 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 and then we'll, get, we'll, we'll, we'll end the call. And then once we end the call, we'll send them that email, and then we'll go from there. The email is going to have, I'll put it in the Google Drive of the template, but it's pretty much, you know, even when I only closed one deal, I was using some email like this. When we closed what? How many, Mike? We closed three deals, right? And we're using that email, right? We closed three deals and we're using an email that said we closed 60 last year. They don't know that shit. And even if you don't have a company, you don't have an LLC, you can still do this. You're a local investor. I know I get that question a lot too. Position yourself as a local investor, you're a local home buyer, you renovate houses, et cetera. Nobody's going to question it. But if you, if you put your hat on like you're that person and you wear that with confidence and you talk with confidence, you know what I'm saying? Nobody's going to question it. If you're asking the right questions, right, if you, uh, mm, uh, uh, you sound like you don't know what the hell you're talking about, people are going to you know, kind of side eye you a little bit. Be confident in what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? Talk like you know this shit. And the only way you get better at doing that is doing it more and more and more and more. I started out not knowing shit about this and unconfident, but I was talking like I knew it. And the more that I talked to people, the more that I understood what they were going to say. Cause certain, you can only say a certain amount of things. You know what I'm saying? The only thing I haven't heard at all was how people curse me out. But other than that, I've heard no, I've heard yes. I've heard, heard not interested. I've heard fuck off. 
and there's certain different things that people say like that cuss me out that I never heard of. That's different. Um, well, somebody somebody says something. He said I can't remember. He said something about I can't remember. It's something crazy funny. Nah, that was the other guy. So he said something about do you know what the what the moon the moon is or some shit like that? Uh, uh, kiss the moon or some shit. He said I'm like what? Some crazy shit. But nevertheless. You know, if you keep talking to people and having these conversations and stay structured on your script and, and everything, you're going to get better. You're going to get better. You're going to get better. You're going to sound more and more confident. You know what I'm saying? Um, any questions about that stuff? I know I was just talking, 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 but any any questions, anything you guys want to add? Feel free. Feel free. Did it all make sense? It was like stupid. <laughs> I got a question. Um, I begin. I live out in Dallas, and I begin a lot of people that say they don't speak English at all. I know you got Mike over there that speak English, but any advice on some like people that don't speak no English, but you drove by their house and it's jacked up? Uh, text them. Okay, that's the best thing I can say. Text them, text them, and because when they they're gonna see it, and when you send them a text message in English, it's gonna show up on their phone in Spanish. Ah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Not all of them. Not, not all, all of them. Google translation. No, no, not all really? of them. So, no, you have to set your phone up that way. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what you can do is you can go, you can go on Google and do uh, Spanish to English translation or English to Spanish translations and Google will pull it up and whatever, whatever you want to put in there, it, it's just a template. You mm -hmm. put it in English, yeah. it'll transfer it to Spanish. And vice versa. Right. So every you, you just go back and forth speaking to them in text message. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Or find a Hispanic friend. <laughs> yeah. Get your Hispanic partner. That's what I did. I was like, <laughs> I speak some Spanish, so that's fine for me. But I mean, I know there's been some stuff that I've I've seen. But yeah, and don't 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 get intimidated when people curse you out. You got to find some way to laugh at it. Yeah. Not laugh in their face per se, but <laughs> shit, I do. <laughs> I do, I do. I can't lie. I can't lie. Let me stop. They, they're gonna if you're not used to dealing with people who are working in sales and you've never dealt with customer service or whether it be in person or on the phone, then uh, don't let somebody cursing you out that does not even know you, does not even know who you are, and will probably never meet you if they curse you out. Don't let that discourage you. I mean, it's just a no, but in a really vulgar way, because I've heard some stuff that I'm not gonna lie. Sometimes I just keep uh keep it going because it's so funny. Yeah, yeah, so, but yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I have Ooh. fun with it. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I gotta get it. I'm gonna be honest with you. If I don't get at least one a week, I, I'm not. I don't feel complete. I need to get cussed out at least once a week. I feel like I ain't called enough people. Man, <laughs> I I literally had I I had this guy. And I said, he, he was, it was, he wasn't just uh, vulgar. He was crazy. Like he was, I don't know. It was really crazy. I would say what he said, but I don't know how many sensitive people we have on the phone. Um, so I'm All not I know say is it. nobody better be sensitive. <laughs> if you're doing I, this business, you can't be. <laughs> I'll say this. Uh, I can't say it. All right, don't say it. Because I, cause, cause I can easily <laughs> say it. You know, I have no quorums in it, but, uh, you know, I just don't know. That's it's a lot of fresh fresh blood, and I don't want to. But but the thing was, me and him kept going. So like, every time he say something, I say something funny, and he say something back, and I say something. Do you know we end up um, meeting up about two days later in Sullivan House? Because <laughs> <laughs> he was just like, after about, probably about 16 hours, he was like, oh, you funny as hell. Mm -hmm. He was like, oh, you crazy just like me. He was like, yeah, meet me at the house on Saturday. We're going to go ahead and do this kind. I was like, Shh. Mm. yeah, it'd be we like didn't that. Even talk about the price. We didn't talk about the price or nothing until we until we met at the house. It'd be like that sometimes. Like I talk to some people and because you, you got to set yourself apart sometimes. You know what I'm saying? That's how you do mm -hmm. it. You know what I'm saying? Like and some of those people, they come at you with they coming at you sideways or well, shit. I go sideways, too. What's up? I've been waiting on you. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I somebody tell them, tell them a little, tell them off a little bit. You know, they'd be like, like people be saying, oh, you don't have them. Like somebody hit me up yesterday. 
you don't have the money to buy my house. I said, I got the money. What you mean? It just got the price got to make sense. You know, I'll just talk. Cra- you know, they trying to talk crazy. I can talk crazy, too. You know what I'm saying? So. I don't know. But make yeah, sure but- you, you make sure you're skilled before you start getting that, <laughs> that deep energy. Because <laughs> when you're new and you kind of you're learning, you want to try to keep the. Calm energy at first. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. No, now, this is what he said. He said, he said, um, he said, you don't know this market. I said, I buy four houses a month. I said, how many houses do you buy a month? Yo, <laughs> what you mean? I don't know the market. Get out of here. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you'll get them. Definitely. You're going to get some people that are crazy. You get some people that, uh, and, and which is really odd because I've gotten a lot lately that are um, kind of overly nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if they don't want to sell, no, not right now. But thank you for asking. Yeah, like, what, the, what is going on at the beginning of this year? Is everybody, everybody working on themselves? Probably. Um, <laughs> don't know because never failed. I got I got one today that mm-hmm, just took away all that goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just I sent one in the chat too the other day yesterday. Yeah, about a, we just having a good conversation, man. It wasn't about he didn't want to sell, but you know, good guy, you know, talking good stuff. And hey, you know, I, I, I was good. But um, I want to get into making offers too. Go ahead and get this thing going because I got you out too long now. Uh, so making offers. So after you done grab, but before I do that, any other questions about what we talked about to this point? Anything anybody want to add? I just want to say I texted a dude back in Spanish. He literally just texted me back. He ain't texted me back in like three hours. Come on, man. So Easy I appreciate peasy. that. <laughs> Easy peasy, man. You don't have to overthink this shit. Sometimes you got to look in a different diff, look, look from a different lens. Sometimes that's what this shit is about, right? That's what this group is about. You know what I'm saying? Like, because some things I don't know until you guys bring it up. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, how do I do this? Oh, shit. I never know about that. You know what I mean? So. You gotta see things from a different perspective because if you're looking through one lens, you get bl- that's all you see, but you don't see things from other perspectives. But that's another fucking conversation. But anyway, so making offers. Um, when we get into making offers, uh, our offer process is pretty simple. So once we once we gather all this information, we run our comps, we put them in the calculators, we come out with our number. If the number is in range, then we'll make the offer. If the number is not in range, when I mean in range, close to what they're asking, like I said, if it's more than that fifty thousand, I'm not going to make the offer. You know what I'm saying? Um, if it's if it's less than that, I'm definitely going to make the offer and just keep following up. And even if if it's not if it's more than that fifty thousand, I don't make the offer. I don't call them back. Sometimes, sometimes I do, and just say, you know, um, we're just going to be too far off in price. Uh, and sometimes they're going to want to offer. Well, what's the number? What's the number? Then I'll give them the number then. But I'm going to say, I don't want to be, you know, disrespectful or I don't want to come off disrespectful or in- insult you with the number. But we're just going to be a little bit off in price. Uh, like Rogelio said, you know, you can offer another way. You can offer terms or something like that to see if they will consider it. But that's if you're on a, that's a different tool. This tool set that I would highly recommend you guys start utilizing. I haven't gotten anything off of that yet, but I do offer it. Uh, I don't offer it as much as I need to which is probably why I haven't gotten anything off of it yet. But, you know, that's one of my accountability things. I need to make term offers and get some terms. But anyway, um, so, yeah, so you just have to make sure, you know, for those people that the number doesn't make sense to, um, sometimes I tell them straight up, like, we're going to be off in price. Don't want to insult you. Uh, but if anything changes, I can reach out. If they want the number, I give them the number. Uh, if we're in that range, then I'm definitely going to make that offer. I don't care. Like I said, if I'm 50000 dollars less than what they want i'm still going to make the offer because remember you took you put a third party in to make the offer they don't think it's coming from you directly it's coming from your underwriter it's coming from your manager so you're in good grace with that seller right say so when we make the offer say yeah so i spoke with our underwriter spoke with my manager and they came back with an offer but before you know we make that offer they wanted me to kind of explain what that process is so once we make our offer um, and everything looks good. I'll send you over, you know, the written offer. Uh, if everything, you know, we'll review that together. If everything looks good and you don't need to review it, that's fine. You can just get that back to us. Once we get that paperwork back from back to us, uh, we'll go ahead and start the title process. Uh, during that title process, we're going to coordinate a time to come out and check out the property, put some eyes on the property, make sure a tree hasn't fallen on it or there's no big hole in the ground or something like that. Um, sometimes they get a little chuckle out of that. 
right? And then, you know, from there, once we, you know, inspect the property, um, if there's, you know, if everything looks good, we'll continue to move forward with the closing date, right? By saying that little thing, that opens up, the ex that sets a little expectation, like, okay, if everything looks good, we'll move forward, but there'll be a possibility that there isn't. So some people I go through and say, you know, sometimes, you know, if there's something there that shows up that we weren't aware of or didn't come up in, you know, our conversation, then, you know, there's a chance that we may have to do a price reduction or if not, then everything looks good, we'll move forward. So sometimes you can set that expectation right there. That way, if you do need to do a price reduction, you've already set that expectation, right? Um, so from there, let me continue on with what, what we say. So after we, you know, if everything looks good, numbers look good, um, after we look at the property, uh, the, the title company will, uh, will provide us with a closing date. Once that closing date is set, will be pretty much clear to close. You got any questions about that? Pretty much cut and dry. And typically a lot of people say no, right? So they don't have any questions. Some people might have a question, whatever, but you've already outlined the next steps, right? Very important to outline the next steps when you present your offer, right? So then I'll get into, you know, the next thing, right? So, you know, based off of everything you told us, our underwriter um, came back, you know, and this number, is, is, like I said before, you don't have to pay any realtor commissions because we're buying the property in cash. You don't have to pay any closing costs because we're going to cover that. Um, and we're buying the property as is condition, which means you don't have to do any updates. You don't have to do any repairs, um, anything like that. You can leave it as is because that's what thing, that's what we're going to do. Um, and with that being said, you know, the offer that came in at 145. And just be quiet. See what they say. Sometimes they'd be like, oh, no, 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 no. Or you'd be like, okay, okay, that works. Okay, sounds good. If it works, let's say if it works, uh, what he says, what if they don't want to be locked in contingent upon a walkthrough or inspection? Uh, I had a seller tell me she wants me to walk it first and she didn't want to be locked in. It really depends. In that situation, it really depends on the price. If her price makes sense, then we'll send either we'll go look at it ourselves or we'll send somebody out there to go look at it. If it's a deal, right? If it's close to being a deal, if it makes sense, then we don't mind doing that. Like we'll look at it, but in every, in every contract, we're going to, we're going to put a due diligence period on it. That's just how it works. And if she wanted to be like that, just say, Hey, listen, you know, ma'am, I understand you don't want, you know, a lot of people aren't going to be buying properties without an inspection or due diligence period. I'm pretty sure when you bought this property, you had to, you had one on there too, didn't you? You know what I'm saying? Yes, we're interested, but we do want to do our due diligence to make sure that, you know, we're not walking into something that's not, that's unexpected. You know what I'm saying? Um, but you can protect yourself with that due diligence period. So if you want to walk it first, if the numbers are tight, I will leave that up to you to make that decision if it makes sense to do it. You know what I'm saying? In that case, for me, how I would handle that, like I said, if the number makes sense, the numbers are tight, right? I'm going to go, I'll go walk it or I'll send somebody to walk it, pay them 50 bucks, go look at it, whatever. And then I'll let them know, okay, this is where we need to be at. And that would be my number. And if she accepts that number, then I'll tell her the minimum we can do on a due diligence period is three days. So that's giving me three days to find a buyer or terminate without any repercussions. So I want to make sure that I have a three-day due diligence. It's company policy. Always revert to company policy. It's your company policy to make sure that you have a due diligence period on your, con on your contracts. And like I said, I reason with people by saying, hey, ma'am, I understand you don't want an inspection or anything like that or due diligence, but I'm pretty sure when you bought your property, that's what you did too, right? Most people who buy properties, that's what they do to make sure that it's something that they really, really want to buy. I don't want to go and buy a property and the foundation is messed up. You know what I'm saying? Um, or something like that. But that's, that's what I would do in that situation. Uh, hope that answered the question. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, and let's say you make your offer, they like it. Then, like I said, you, we go ahead and we'll send them the written offer and then we'll go through it together. Da, 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 da. Then boom, they'll lock it up. We'll lock it up and sign it. Now let's say we make that offer and they don't accept it. 
you can tell how far off you are by based off of their reaction sometimes. So they give you a crazy reaction. Oh, hell no, I'm not selling that for that. No, 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 no. They do something crazy like that, and you know you're way off. Even still, if we are way off when we get that reaction, my response is, okay, sounds good. Well, what number, um, how close to that could you get? Or what would be the best you can do to get to that number? And maybe I can take it back to my underwriter, my manager, and see if we can make that work. You know what I'm saying? And typically people who give you that kind of response or reaction, they didn't give you a price to begin with. <laughs> you know? Um, now, if they give you a number and it still doesn't make sense, you just let them know. Say, hey, um, that number just is, is just gonna, it's not going to work for us. Unfortunately, we're not going to be a good fit at the price that you're looking for. But, you know, if anything changes, I'll give you a call and, and, and let you know. But I appreciate the opportunity. And that person right there, any person that you get to this point with to making an offer, you follow up with them every two weeks. Every two weeks until that property is sold. I don't care if they told you no seven times. Every two weeks is twice a month. You keep following up with them until that property is sold. And what that follow-up looks like is, hey, Jason, I was just reaching out to you. I know the numbers didn't make sense last time, but I was seeing if you still, you know, you're still looking to sell that property there. I see you haven't sold it yet. It's not on the market, so I see you haven't sold it yet. Oh, well, I'm under contract right now. Okay, when's the closing date on that? Uh, the closing date on that one is, you know, April 20th. Okay, sounds good. I'll, I'll, I'll check in around then and, you know, see if you close it. But we're still interested. And you keep doing that every two weeks. Those are the people that you're going to get. You know what I'm saying? Like the guy that I made an offer to, right? you know, yesterday, and I was 15K off the first time I offered, I offered him the number, the number, and I only offered like three grand more. And he was like, oh, that's right on point. That was right what I was thinking. But the first time he told me, oh, the house appraised for 60000 <laughs> So I'm like, what? But I continued to follow up with him, even though he didn't answer until this time. And he probably didn't remember it was me. You know what I'm saying? So that's the key to getting these deals, man. Anybody that you get to this point with and you're making that offer, whether they accept, if they don't accept it, you continue to follow up. If they verbally accept it and they just go ghost, your ass better be calling them every single day from different phone numbers, texting and everything. You know what I'm saying? And figure out why they ain't, why they ghosting you. There's a guy that I've been calling since January because everything was sweet, but he just went MIA, calling him from seven numbers every single day. Got him on a drip campaign, still not responding. I hope he ain't passed away. But because sometimes they block your number, so you got to change your numbers up. You know what I'm saying? That's how that's how you got to do it. That's how persistent you got to be. That's how you got to be if you want to make shit happen. And that it, it can't be just a one off. That has to be how you operate. You know what I'm saying? Not just one particular lead. You need to you need to manage every lead and handle every lead like that. Because those opportunities going to come like that. Like if you're not following up with that lead, there's somebody out there like me that's doing that. And you're going to miss the boat. You know what I'm saying? So you want to make sure that you staying on top of your shit and you got to hold yourself accountable to that. Okay, did I talk to my seller that I made an offer to two weeks ago today or this week? Did I call him this week? Nope. Boom. Because what's going to happen when you missing, when you're not consistent with that follow up like that and you make a call or you see the shit on Zillow that he sold it for less than what you offered him because you'd missed the boat on that. Because a lot of times. They're not going to call you back if you don't make yourself present and make yourself known and make uh, consistently. They're going to go with somebody who just called them and made them a lower offer and be like, okay, I knew I couldn't get, and we call it, we let time beat them up. That's how we, t we call it. We call it let time beat them up because that's exactly what happened. Over time, they realized that they couldn't get that number and that number dropped lower and lower and lower. You know what I'm saying? So that follow up got to be consistent. Very important. But we only make, we only do that on, on properties that or sellers that we've made offers to. So if you've if any of you guys have made offers to anybody at all and you haven't reached out to them and it's been two, three, four, five months, six months, you better you better reach out. Put them back into your leads. Put them back in there. Fire them back up. See if they still got that property available. You know what I'm saying? See if they're considering an offer. And then 
in situations like if you have the drip campaign sequences and all this stuff kind of set up in your in your system and your processes, then you add them into that drip campaign process as well. Right. So every two weeks they're getting a text message and then they're getting a call from you. So they're seeing that message every two weeks over and over and over and over again, whether it's the same message or you change it up. Like I said in the beginning of the call on that SMS template, one of those messages are from a drip campaign sequence. Say something like, you know, I know last time we spoke, we were a little off on numbers. Are you still open to selling your property? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Something like that. So that's that's the making offer side. Don't overcomplicate it. The key is outline the next steps in the process, set the expectation, and then outline your benefits. You're covering closing costs. You're not paying, they're not going to pay any realtor commissions, and you're buying an as is condition, right? Those are the benefits when you make your offer. So those are the key things that you do, right, uh, on making offers. Any questions about making offers? Anything anybody want to add? Anybody do anything different? You said you anchor them as well, or no? I don't anchor anymore. No, huh? I, you don't? Nope. I give them my best offer. I roll with that. All right. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't fuck around now. I ain't got time for that. <laughs> not saying, <laughs> not saying, real. not saying that anchoring is bad, but you can, you can out, you can, you can get outed with that. You know what I'm saying? Because some people don't want to negotiate. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Some people don't. So I guess you really got to feel your seller out and kind of see how they are. You know what I'm saying? Because there's some sellers that straight shooters, they they don't want to negotiate. They're not going to go with the back and forth shit. If you offer too low, that's going to X you out immediately. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but if you do want to, you... you can give yourself a little room. I don't mind that. Because, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I just tell them, like, you know, basically, you know, I'm seeing other people as far as what are other companies, cash buyers paying for. And Ty, by any means, that's not my offer or anything like that. But I do see other people paying. And then I give them a range, like ten to 12000 Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like an anchor and all that. And like yeah. I told him, you know, that's not my offer by any means. That's just what I'm seeing as far as like what are other people paying similar mm -hmm. properties like yours. And then you'll say you'll follow it up and say, would that be something you would consider? Or is that like, yeah, like, <clears throat> like is that something you were hoping to get or is that somewhere where you need to be at? Mm -hmm. Yeah, somewhere around that. Yeah. And, and typically, what do they say after that? Yeah. So they're like, mm, I mean, I would want a little more than that. And I'm just, okay, I mean, how much more and all that? And I just try to go up from there and all that. Yeah. But basically, I'm trying to, yeah, just trying to get big deals, to be honest. That's why. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. I don't mind that at yeah. all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I said, if you're not too, too far off, like if they're at 200000 and you're anchoring them at 100000 then <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But sometimes, you know, you deal with those people who are unrealistic. So that's the main thing, like in the qualifying side on the front end, you know, when you ask them about, you know, the price and all that stuff, you want to make sure that it's somebody that's realistic, you know what I'm saying, before you even get to that point, you know what I mean? But if it's one of those what's your offer type people, like sometimes um, in text messages, they'll say what's your offer. What I've been doing lately, I've just been shooting out numbers. You know what I'm saying? Obviously, I look it up and whatever and, and do something and, you know, do a quick analysis. I look at the Zillow. I'll just look at comps on Zillow first. And I won't even go in depth like that, but I'll throw out something and it'll, it'll be anchored on that. You know what I'm saying? In that instance. But if it's somebody that right. I've actually taken the time to kind of walk through and, and did this and that, uh, I'll probably give them like the best number. But it's it's no right or wrong way to do that, to be honest. Right. And then when you throw out those, I'm assuming lowball offers, do you get a response back? Do you get a good amount of people reply back or they just leave you on scene after that? Because you respond, have like no report or bill with them. Huh? Yes, yeah, some yeah. respond, some don't. Somebody said yesterday, are you on something? Um, <laughs> and um, But some respond, some, some don't. Uh, if they do respond with something that's not like, are you on something or something that's like, oh, I can't make that work or something like that. Then I'll, I'll just follow up. Right. You know, if they don't respond, then I'll just, hey, did you get my last message? You right. know, that's my follow-up. And then these message. are prospects, right? They're not leads. There's people you're marketing to, SMS, yeah. or they yeah. leads? Those are people that we marketed to. They hit you with the Prospect. what's your offer. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but right. they turned themselves into a lead by saying that. 
you know what I'm saying? Now, whether they're hot or warm, that's 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 up to discussion. Right. Oh, okay. So do so you consider that a lead? Yeah, huh? Just because they said, well, they did respond with the positive, right? Like, yeah. What's your offer? So yep. All right. Yep. So they're in our CRM. Yeah. Once they respond, okay. what's your offer? They're in our CRM at that point. Right. Because like I, mean, I said, you say you don't call them. You don't call them right away, huh? Whenever. Yeah, we, we call them. Back. Yeah, we yeah. call them. Okay. Sometimes it just really depends. Typically, we want to call them first. Um, we'll respond to them and text real quick. So if they say like, what's your offer? Then um, I play it. I play it both ways. Sometimes it's like I, I do different things to see what works best. So I'll either one lately, I say I've been giving them a number and seeing what the response is on that. And the reason why I started doing that is because when I before I used to say, you know, our offers are dependent on the condition, um, you know, what kind of condition is the property in? I try to see if I can get some information out of that. But most people, they don't respond back to that. They're not trying to go through that shit over the phone through text message. Most people, you see what I'm saying? So in that, that's why I learned it's better to either call them right away, have hit them with a short response right away. Or, you know what I'm saying? Like, give them that number right away. You know, if they say, what's your offer? You know what I mean? Just really depends. Right. Yeah. It just really depends. Um, because, like, how many times have, I don't know how much, how many times people, how much text messaging people do um, in here. But, I mean, how often do you have a seller that's going to be like, roof is 10 years old. This is this. This is this. This is this. This is this. You know what I'm saying? So you can get nothing. Not, yeah. not often, you know? Mm-mm. Yeah, so not best through to text. Get, if yeah, yeah, it's best to get them on the phone when you can. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anything else, anybody, about making offers? And then nothing. Another thing to add too is like you know when those offers, the cash offers don't work. Um, you know, you get into the seller finance. You see if they have a mortgage or not. You get into the sub two shit. Uh, you get into the creative deals. You get into that novation stuff. Um, I don't know too much about all of that, to be completely honest. Um, I'm actually working on getting somebody that does novations on the group, one of these calls. So he called himself the Novation King. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how that works. But, um, but yeah, that's, you know, that's why it's important to have different other different strategies in your tool belt so you know what to do when the cash offer don't work because not all the time you can make money on the cash offer or the cash offer is going to work. You may be able to make more money if you do something else, or you may be able to turn a deal that's not a deal into a deal by using a different strategy. You know what I'm saying? So it's important to constantly keep learning about different types of exit strategies. So it's just not always wholesale, wholesale, wholesale. You know what I'm saying? Because if you're just doing wholesale, 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 you're limiting yourself as to what you can do, right? You may have deals sitting in there that somebody be, might be willing to take a seller finance on. You know what I'm saying? And you can make 10K or 15K off a seller finance deal by assigning it to somebody else. You know what I'm saying? You still can wholesale it, but you have to be able to, to identify and set those terms that make sense for somebody else to want to take it. You know? So that's important. Um, and then lastly, the title process. I'll go through that real quick. Uh, this is pretty cut and dry. Uh, whenever you're going through title, you just want to make sure you communicate with the seller, keep the seller updated, because um, a lot of times they probably don't check their emails as they need to. Uh, the title company might be asking for information, like a, a picture of their driver's license, their seller information sheet, things along those lines. And if you want to speed up your closing and make sure you have an on-time closing, uh, part of that is going to be on the seller getting gathering the information that the title company needs. Uh, another part of it is going to be the actual title company doing what the hell they're supposed to be doing. So as you're going along the, the, the title and the closing process, you want to make sure you keep your sellers up to date. Um, you know, you want to keep them informed and know and, and knowing what the hell is going on with with the process. If they're on track to close, if the, if the title company needs anything. So you want to be communicating with both parties at the same time, essentially. So you, what that looks like is, you know, you get it under contract. The first step you're going to send you know, the purchase and sales agreement and assignment agreement to the title company, they're going to reach out to the seller. They should be reaching out to the seller within one to two days. So if the seller, if they haven't reached out to the seller, then you need to be on top of them and say, hey, you, you contact the seller. Hey, Mr. Seller, did the, did the attorney reach out to you? Did the title company reach out to you? If the seller says no, then you need to be making a call to the title company and be like, hey, um, 
the seller says nobody reached out to him about starting the title process. Uh, can we get this going? From there, they'll contact them, tell them to copy you in all the emails so you know what's going on. And then every week after that, you want to get an update on the title. You know, the following week, hey, did the title come back? It usually takes about five days for title to come back, right? Um, so at the following week, you want to get an update on that. Hey, is the title clear? Is the title of search been complete? The, then the title company, they'll tell you they need X, Y, Z, or they're waiting for X, Y, and Z. And then you can update the seller. Be like, hey, seller, this is what's going on with the title. Um, they're waiting on this, 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 and this, whatever the case may be. So, and then you just keep them informed all the way through closing. Once title is cleared out, you know, they'll reach out to you to confirm the closing date. Literally like a week before closing, I would reach out to the title company um, to see if they provide you with the HUD or the settlement statement. Uh, Cause typically once that is sent to you, that means closing is pretty much set in stone and the money and everything is good to go. And the title is cleared and out and everything. So literally at least two days before closing, you need to be looking for that settlement statement or that HUD statement from the title company. But, and that's pretty much it. It's pretty much it. Anybody got any questions about anything we discussed? Anything at all? Quiet bunch tonight. Okay. Okay. Well, cool. 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 Well, I hope this added some value. I hope this, you know, helped somebody out. Um, there's a script in the drive. Make sure you check out the script in the drive if you need some scripts. I need to talk about talk to sellers. Um, that script was carefully constructed line by line. Um, so it was structured the right way, line by line. Uh, that makes the most sense to make to have a smooth conversation. But um, if you guys came in late, this is recorded. I'll upload it to the Google Drive probably tomorrow because it's going to take a while to download. But I'll upload it to the drive tomorrow so you can look back at it. Uh, be on the lookout for the comp session next week. Um, be on the lookout for an accountability call probably next week as well. Um, and just be on the lookout for some new shit, man. So I got a whole bunch of stuff coming. Um, the competition is still running. You guys keep fucking closing deals. If there's anything I can do to help, just feel free to reach out. Let me know. And if anybody's in Atlanta, we're going to do another, uh, property walkthrough probably in two weeks. So be on the lookout for that as well. But other than that, you guys have a good night. And then I'll see you. I'll see you in the Discord. All right, Ty. Later, later, later.